Everybody should be on mute except for uh, Professor Nickter and myself. Right? Okay. Right. And thank you for joining us tonight for the book talk with Professor Luke Nickter. I am Andrew Natsius, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs here at the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M University. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Nickter to you today. Professor Nickter is a, is a professor of history and Beck Family Senior Fellow at Texas A&M University, Central Texas, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow for 2020-2021. His area of specialty is the Cold War, the modern presidency, U.S. political and diplomatic history with a focus on the long 1960s from John F. Kennedy through Watergate. He's been a visiting fellow at the Norwegian Noble Institute and Andrew W. Mellon Fellow at the Massachusetts Historical Society, a visiting scholar at the University of Michigan's Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies, a senior visiting research fellow at the University of Oxford's Rother Meyer American Institute, a Hansard research fellow, a research scholar at the London School of Economics, a visiting scholar at Bowling Green State University and a National Endowment for Humanities Public Scholar. He is a noted expert on Richard Nixon's secret White House tapes. He is New York Times bestselling author and editor of seven books, including Richard Nixon in Europe, the reshaping of the post-war Atlantic world which was based on multilingual archival research in six countries. His most recent book, The Last Brahmin, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. and the Making of the Cold War was published by Yale University Press. It is the first full biography of Lodge whose public career spanned uh, the 1930s to the 1970s and is based on extensive multilingual archival research. Uh, I would like to turn over the uh, microphone, so to speak, the Zoom phone to uh, Professor Nickter now for this wonderful uh, talk about this wonderful book. Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I, I think we can all agree uh, how much more we would enjoy this event in person yes. in a more uh, egalitarian setting that would allow for more debate and discussion. You know, the kind of event that I've attended at the Scowcroft Institute in the past. Uh, but, you know, as more and more of us are getting the vaccine, I got my own first dose of the Pfizer vaccine today. I'm, I'm still here in vertical. Uh, I, am re I am reassured that more normal days are ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Scowcroft Institute and the, the Bush School for hosting this event, especially since the Texas A&M University system has been my intellectual home for the last 13 years. Uh, this fall, I am taking up a new position in presidential studies at Chapman University in Orange County, California. Uh, but Texas will always feel like home, uh, even though uh, lifelong Texans would probably say that the only real Texan in our family is our daughter, born in Temple, whereas my wife and I have simply been longtime visitors. Uh, well, I, I, let me start by uh, telling you what I hope to accomplish with the, the next half hour or so of our time. Uh, you know, it's always hard to guess how many in an audience especially like this, where I don't have the usual nonverbal cues and nods or people, you know, students sleeping in the back of the room. Um, to, you know, it's always hard to, hard to guess how, how many have read some portion of the book, uh, especially since we've had, you know, nothing at all, at, at all on our minds you know, since its pub date in September. Um, but the book is really more than a biography of Lodge, you know, someone with a half century career. So all I can really hope to do tonight is to, to focus on one part of the story. Um, I think the most uh, engaging thing I can, I can think to do uh, since this writing this book and researching it was really a process uh, is to talk a little about what I learned along the way uh, about Lodge, about uh, writing and research, uh, the, about the process of discovery and the challenges associated with addressing uh, what, what I term a half century old myth. That way, uh, when you do have a chance to, to read it, these points might have greater meaning. Um, I sent around the, the review and also the, uh, the, the video link earlier today, uh, not to add to your reading load, but for those who might not have had a whole time to read a whole book, uh, that would allow you to kind of get into it and get engaged tonight uh, without uh, uh, as big of a burden. Uh, at the end of our talk tonight, our event, I'll be happy to answer some questions. And if you'd like to ask a question and don't get a chance to, just send me an email. I'm, I'm pretty approachable. I always enjoy hearing from readers. 
and the new ideas that are usually stimulated in those discussions. Well, where I start is where I start with my students. Uh, you know, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. is the most famous person you've never heard of. Uh, now, maybe some of you have, of course, and might even know something about him. Uh, but that's what I say to my students about the man who has been largely forgotten since his death about 35 years ago. Uh, I, don't, I don't myself know when I first heard the name Henry Cabot Lodge, probably either in high school or in college. However, I, I remember my reaction. You know, he was a person with a famous sounding name, yet I could not place him. Uh, for example, you know, was he the one who was Woodrow Wilson's nemesis? If so, how old could he have been when he ran with Richard Nixon in 1960? You know, Lodge, after all, did look older, more like the grandfatherly Eisenhower during that race than the youthful Nixon. But for this kid who grew up in the Midwest, Lodge had one of those names that you knew was important, but you did not know why. For many, the misunderstanding is co compounded by the fact that Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. was named not for his father, who died when Cabot, as he was known, was young, uh, but his grandfather. In addition, there are so many Cabots and Lodges even today, especially in the Northeast, and family traditions are such that certain names like Henry repeat throughout multiple generations of the family tree. Also, I should start by saying, you know, this is a book I never planned to write. You know, as a writer, there are things you spend a lot of time on, but they never quite get traction. Then there are things that you have no plan to write that come together with a momentum of their own. This book was definitely in the, in the latter category. Uh, the executive editor of Yale University Press, William Frucht, you know, who had become my editor, you know, called us a number of years ago to just to ask what I, what I know about Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Uh, he had finished uh, editing a book on Nixon's vice presidency and Lodge's name kept coming up. And so he was, he was curious. Uh, I, I tried to think of an erudite answer to his question, but the best I could do is the truth and not much. Uh, from past work, I knew Lodge's name was one that came up uh, often on the uh, Kennedy, Johnson and, White, and Nixon White House tapes. And so those are things I've worked on a lot in the last 15 years, making almost unique in that sense that he comes up across all three of those. But still, Lodge was uh, basically an enigma to me. Uh, then Bill asked me what the big book was on Lodge, and I said I didn't think there was one. So uh, he, he asked me if I'd like to propose one. Uh, at the time that I did, signing a contract in 2015, you know, I knew Lodge had a substantial volume of personal papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and that research, given the length of his career, uh, as said, they're uh, really 1930s, uh, 20s, if you go back earlier, for, for graduation from college. Uh, all the way certainly through the, you know, into the well into the Carter administration and his death in the middle of the Reagan administration, you know, I figured that's, that's going to require trips to all the presidential libraries, you know, Hoover through Reagan, and probably an extended trip to Vietnam. Uh, but I really didn't know what I was getting into here. Uh, I, I'm the kind of researcher that if you're going to write about when Lodge met Eisenhower during the war in the Mediterranean theater, uh, you've got to go to Algier, you know, to the Hotel St. George at the top of the hill and see the site of Eisenhower's headquarters and really kind of create the scene, kind of scene set when you're describing that part of the book. Uh, research is kind of an obsession uh, like that for me, uh, which is especially problematic when you've got someone who had a such a long career uh, that took him to so many parts of the world. Um, I retraced for the research of the book many of Lodge's steps around the world uh, with, with the exception of some more fragile places in Central Asia. Uh, you know, there are limits to what even the most forgiving spouse will permit. Uh, now here at the under, other end of this journey, you know, whether one comes away from this first biography of Henry Cabot Lodge admiring him more or less, the real purpose is to show uh, that Lodge was so much more than meets the eye and to restore his rightful place in history that he really always occupied. The sheer number of notable events with which he was associated, you know, yet his role has been hidden, you know, makes him a cross between a kind of Where's Waldo or Forrest Gump figure, or even James Bond, I would say at times. Uh, the events themselves, you know, with which he's associated are often recognizable, but we didn't know Lodge's role in them. And sometimes seeing those events through Lodge's eyes changes our understanding of those events themselves. Uh, a, a member of the greatest generation crossed with the best and the brightest, you know, Lodge's values and sacrifice of self for bigger causes are traits in short supply that our society needs again. These days we're probably all cynics when it comes to politics, so it's hard to believe that someone like Lodge ever existed. And you know, while some politicians give lip service to serving the greater good, uh, most famously stated in John F. Kennedy's admonition, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, Lodge lived it. 
His record of bipartisan pub public service uh, combined with his dramatic conversion from isolationism uh, to internationalism made him a unique figure, I argue. Lodge was the last true Boston Brahmin, and here I say this at the Bush School, <laughs> to be active in public life, yet his career harks back to a time when compromise was an art and a comedy of virtue instead of the political liabilities they've become. Now I'm going to share my screen here. I have a a few uh, uh, photos that will sort of illustrate the, the points that, that I make here. We'll, I'll share and reshare, unshare a couple different times here. Um, you know, I start with the cover of the book because it, it was difficult uh, finding a cover uh, uh, for this book that captured someone with so many different phases of his life and career. Besides the one that's on the cover, um, I'd like to show you a few more. Uh, these are among those featured in the book and I think they give you a flavor for who Lodge was. You know, it, even the title, I mean, first we went back and forth with the ambassador, but he wasn't just an ambassador, you know, something to do with senator, but he wasn't always a senator. It was really kind of hard to, to, to capture something that really was the whole person. And in this case, it was kind of one of the themes throughout his career was kind of a man in motion. Uh, and here, this is a photo from 1952, uh, right after the 52 election, and he's on the way to a White House meeting. And when I found the photo, it was already perfectly blurred. You know, it took no alteration at all uh, from a photo editor. Uh, so I knew it was right when, I, when, when uh, I found it. But equally, I could have chosen others. Uh, this was also one of my, my, uh, my favorites. Uh, this photo with Lyndon Johnson really captures the behind the scenes role that Lodge played advising five consecutive presidents from Dwight Eisenhower through Gerald Ford. Uh, in addition to other presidents that Lodge knew uh, personally, socially, beginning with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, here in this photo on the South Lawn, uh, Johnson and Lodge must have escaped the Oval Office undetected, continuing their conversation outside, away from Johnson's taping system. Once the press figured out they were on the loose, they quickly worked to catch up. It's a theme throughout Lodge's career, a, a private conversation with the president, uh, keeping colleagues and especially the press off guard about his movements. In this, uh, in this next one is something I've also seen more than once. Uh, here we have a White House reception for the Lodge family in 1966, uh, where you can see LBJ pulls Lodge off to the side for what appears to be a brief but serious conversation. The event was also notable because it was attended by virtually the entire cabinet. And you can see a number of familiar faces in the crowd, including Lodge's son, George, in the very kind of background of the photo right behind LBJ's neck. Um, and then kind of on the right half of the photo from left to right, the faces that you can see, uh, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, uh, then uh, kind of the side three quarters shot back shot of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and of course, Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Uh, this reception, the photos during the LBJ period are partic particularly rich for Lodge in the research because he was in the US for so much. So he was photographed at so many White House events whereas other parts of his career, he was overseas and, and uh, they're not as documented as well for photos. Uh, but this reception here was then followed by a formal dinner for Lodge, for the Lodge family, arguably the greatest honor they were ever paid by a, a sitting president that I've, that I've ever found. This next photo is, is, uh, is also something I see a lot. Um, you know, for a period of nearly 20 years, Lodge was often in the room when important decisions were made. While not always in the cabinet, he consistently operated at that level, or even as a second, a second Secretary of State, such as when he served as UN, UN ambassador for both terms of the Eisenhower administration, with no one exceeding his length of service in that role before or since, or taking the toughest job in the Foreign Service on two occasions in Vietnam. Having the title was something that, he, that Lodge rarely sought, and on more than one time in his career, he donated his paycheck back to the government. Here again with McNamara, Rusk, and Johnson, uh, when Lodge was at his, asked his opinion, others in the room uh, took note. I'm going to unshare there. Um, rather than learn what Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. stood for or the lessons of his life, instead we've largely forgotten him, you know, as we did other members of the best and the brightest generation for their role in Vietnam, a byproduct of internationalist zeal. For example, what's the big book on, on Dean Rusk? I would argue there isn't one. Or Robert McNamara, or the Bundys, Bill and McGeorge, or Walt Rostow. I, again, I would argue there's really not been a definitive biography of these, these uh, central figures from this time period. 
But unlike the others, the bulk of Lodge's 50-year public life had to do with subjects other than Vietnam. In the post-war era, in terms of foreign policy influence and sheer versatility, I put Lodge up there with George Marshall, Henry Kissinger, and James Baker, you know, each of their own era. But unlike the rest, Lodge gave some of his best years of public service in democratic administrations. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to believe that, that people like Lodge not just willingly worked for Democrats like John F. Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson, but considered it a duty and an honor to do so. Or that presidents like Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Dwight Eisenhower each appointed members of the opposite party to the Supreme Court. We should remember Lodge for taking part in and expanding the American adventure in Vietnam, but his, his half century public life was much more than that. Born in 1902, an entire generation of Americans has been born and come of age since his death in 1985 that has not learned about him or the lessons of his life and times, except at most a brief mention in relation to the Vietnam War. Lodge, being old fashioned, did himself no great service by never properly explaining his side of controversial subjects or writing a tell all memoir. He naturally shunned self promotion, his son George Cabot Lodge told me when I asked why his father left so many important subjects unaddressed. Never tell them how you did it, Lodge once said when asked whether he planned to write a comprehensive history of his career. I do not see myself doing a book, he said, because if it's interesting, it means I've revealed things which I should not reveal. And if I don't reveal them, then the book will be dull, he once said. Uh, he wrote that to Evan Thomas II, at one point, one of eight editors uh, interested in publishing his memoirs. Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. was a household name in an era of big personalities and big ideas that stood out against the mundane and the mediocre. To me, there's something appealing once again about public officials who seek opportunities to serve for a primary reason other than financial gain. On three occasions, Lodge gave up his political career to serve the greater good. First, when he resigned from the Senate to serve in World War II. Second, when he sacrificed a safe Senate seat uh, to manage Eisenhower's campaign for the presidency in 1952. And third, when he willingly accepted an appointment from a Democratic president to the most challenging diplomatic post in the world in Vietnam, uh, both in 1963 and again in 1965. Yet no one, including those who benefited from Lodge's sacrifices, was there to help him in 1964 when I argue he had a genuine chance for the presidency following his surprise win in the New Hampshire primary, even though Lodge's success would have helped those who withheld their support. The events of Lodge's life in that first ambassadorial tour in Saigon from 1963 to 1964 represent one of the greatest turning points in not just what would become known as the Vietnam War, but the history of the entire Cold War. This is a subject I'd like to focus on for a little, a little time here for the remainder with you. Uh, you know, Lodge's role in Vietnam has been the subject of a half century old myth. Uh, due to President Kennedy's assassination, histories of the administration were written unusually quickly, even though there were a few declassified records available to offer a fuller view. The publication of the Pentagon Papers beginning in 1971, uh, further set in stone the conventional wisdom of Lodge in Vietnam, in particular his role in the November 1st coup in 1963 that toppled South Vietnamese President Ngo Dinh Diem, which became the point of no return for full-blown American involvement in the Vietnam War. Beginning in the mid-1960s, Lodge was blamed by those close to President Kennedy, including Bobby Kennedy, for exceeding his authority in Saigon, not responding to US government instructions and doing who knows what with the coup plotting generals. Something about these accusations never seemed quite right to me if for no other reason because so many records remained restricted until, so, until, until very recently. Yet it's very difficult to overturn the conventional wisdom of such a firmly established version of events. Of the 53 people that I interviewed or corresponded with or communicated with in some form for the book, including family members and virtually every former associate of Lodge's. One in particular early on gave me a suggestion uh, that I not, not only did I carry out, but resulted in the particular book that you see. Rufus Phillips, you know, who wrote a good book about Vietnam called Why Vietnam Matters about a dozen years ago, was a JFK era official for USAID who was serving in Vietnam uh, at the time of Lodge's first appointment uh, as ambassador in August, 1963. Uh, Phillips is the, is the last living American to have known CM personally, and I think he considered it a kind of personal failure when, you, when the U.S. withdrew its support from a close American ally. Uh, 
over breakfast uh, at a diner in Arlington, Virginia with Phillips uh, at the beginning of my research, uh, Rufus encouraged me to try to study the origins of Lodge's appointment to Vietnam. The most important contribution you could make, he said to me, was to determine Kennedy's instructions to Lodge regarding the coup that toppled South Vietnamese President Ngo Dinh Diem on November 1st, 1963. Phillips said Lodge always told him in Vietnam that Kennedy had authorized a coup, uh, but no evidence for this allegation ever surfaced. He didn't ask, Phillips didn't ask for it, Lodge never offered it. But it hardly, hardly seemed possible that I could find something new that adds to our understanding of an event that has been written about so many times. The most famous account being those featured in the Pentagon Papers, in addition to the mid 1970s published volumes of the Church Committee. The conventional wisdom is that the coup, which occurred with some degree of CIA support, was the, a key turning point in terms of American military involvement in Vietnam, resulting in the overthrow and assassination of CM, the event that was supposed to increase stability in Saigon by removing a widely unpopular leader instead greatly destabilized Vietnam. As Colin Powell said about Iraq, when you break it, you buy it. And the Zam coup was arguably when the US bought it. Three weeks later, Kennedy himself was killed. And in fewer than 18 months, the first US Marines were deployed to the beaches of Da Nang in March of 1965. Well, having spent so long studying the Nixon White House tapes, I wondered whether the answer could be in the Kennedy tapes. Two of Lodge's meetings with Kennedy occurred after the initiation of the Kennedy taping system in the summer of 1962 and in a location where taping, the taping system functioned in June and August of 63 in the Oval Office. Uh, I've seen a number of strange things to say the least with respect to the Nixon tapes uh, or a tape. Uh, uh, so, so what I hoped with the Kennedy tapes was to find evidence of a tape that once existed or a tape that remained classified that maybe I could request a review of or anything at all that might simply lead to the next clue. What Rufus Phillips suggested to determine what Kennedy and Lodge might have discussed about the coup seemed like an impossible task. Kennedy obviously didn't live to write about the coup to tell his side, and Lodge generally did not talk about it with only a few exceptions where he was disciplined enough to stick to a very general account of their conversations. Uh, now I will get back to sharing my screen here. Okay. I've got to skip over some of the details here. We can talk about them during the Q&A period. But the first thing I tried to do was to dig in some records about the provenance of the Kennedy tapes, uh, the deed of gift, where they were stored, uh, how they were processed, any irregularities in, in the chain of custody in, in 50 years, it, it, to the extent these things are documented, and where, when the existence of the Kennedy taping system became public notice, which is what you see here in this 1982 front page story in the Washington Post authored by a journalist who had already become famous for writing about presidential tapes, Bob Woodward. Uh, while word about the Kennedy tapes had begun to spread in, really in the 1970s, after the disclosure of the Nixon taping system in the summer of 1973, it was this piece by Woodward in the Washington Post that really gave front page attention to the Kennedy tapes for the first time. Besides the big headline that you see in the inside pages of the newspaper that day were extensive logs published of uh, the, the dates the Kennedy tapes uh, taping system operated, subjects discussed, people Kennedy met with. Uh, these were not transcripts or anything from the tapes, but really kind of the organiza organization of the Kennedy taping system and just kind of documenting its, its existence. For me, this was really the first strike against me in the task that uh, Rufus Phillips had given me because the dates listed uh, on the right hand side, it's a little blurry and hard to see, the dates listed, which was at the time the official record and official dates uh, that the system operated, skip right over Lodge's meeting with Kennedy on August 15th, 1963, his farewell meeting. In other words, no recording was made of the meeting. Uh, I figured that might be a good place to look to find out, you know, did Kennedy give Lodge any instructions in the last time that, as far as I know, they ever met uh, because Lodge left for Vietnam and uh, did not return to the United States until after Kennedy's assassination. So this was really the first strike against me here, uh, but I wasn't quite ready to give up yet. Uh, in this next one, um, and, and you don't need to read all this, I'll, I'll uh, focus on a portion of it in just a minute. Um, you know, many writers, uh, well, well known, better known than me, uh, more, more uh, than a few famous Vietnam era journalists have been over the same terrain before. When you look at all the, the, the very uh, well done, well researched books about Vietnam, you know, not to mention, um, 
uh, investigations with a, a, a statutory reason to know the facts. The Pentagon Papers, uh, the Church Committee, uh, which had really had, especially the Church Committee, had a statutory ability to see everything in the mid-1970s. That seemed like a good starting point to me to see the extent to which those who came before me looked into this and what they might have discovered. If they lost, maybe if they lost the scent or if the trail went cold, that could be a good place for me to pick up the search now that more records are, are, are available. And I was, I was uh, struck when I first uh, started this research that um, you know, I would guess easily hundreds, probably a total of thousands of pages on the ZM coup had never been opened or remained restricted to the JFK library. And so events, you know, it, it seemed uh, it, to me, it was just, this is the fascinating part of research that you can learn so many new things about something that's over 50 years old that maybe no one, that we don't know yet, that no one else has seen. Um, and so I started to, to follow the trail of what others seen before me uh, while I was putting in these requests, because sometimes you wait a long time for these requests to come back. And I, I went through David Halberstam papers up at BU in Boston. I went through Neil Sheehan's Library of Congress and other of the big journalists, talked to the journalists, everybody who was alive, uh, and others who were in Saigon during the coup, which seemed like the most obvious places to, to get started. Some of these remained in private hands, in part because a few people are still alive from that era. Uh, I, for example, I was able to get some of Arthur Dahman's correspondence from his estate. I found this particular letter to be interesting and responsive to my search, one from one Kennedy scholar expert to another, from Arthur Dahman to Robert Dalek in 2003. Of course, each uh, wrote extensively about Kennedy in Vietnam and spent even longer trying to make sense of it. Sense of it. Uh, the last paragraph is what caught my eye, so I'll enlarge that on the next slide. Uh, the paragraph appeared to be strike two in my research. Uh, I'd like to read it, this final, again, this final paragraph of a letter from Dahman to Dalek, August 1st, 2003. Uh, I'm grateful to you for confirming in your letter that there appears to be no written record of Kennedy's instructions to Lodge. Without knowledge of what Kennedy asked Lodge to do in Saigon, of course, we are at a serious disadvantage. I doubt seriously that it will turn up at the Kennedy Library, although I will keep checking as you wisely suggest. And I am convinced that Lodge, in his effort to cover his tracks after masterminding the overthrow of the legally constituted government of South Vietnam and the murder of President Siem, destroyed all copies of his instructions, which most assuredly did not instruct him to do these things. And that is why Ann Blair did not find it in Lodge's papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society when she went through them. They reference Ann Blair, an Australian scholar who wrote a book in the mid 1990s called Lodge in Vietnam, uh, one of the few previous works about any, any of any part about Lodge's career, although about only a small part of his life. This letter seemed to be the second piece of evidence that suggested I was wasting my time by looking for something where so many others had already searched and come to fairly firm conclusions. Finally, I thought about whether there were people prior to me who had a statutory reason to know what Kennedy and Lodge might have discussed about a subject as sensitive as the Siam coup. That led me to Les Gelb, the general editor of the Pentagon Papers, who had some additional clues, but not the type I was looking for. I kept coming back to the church committee, but other than the published volumes in the mid-1970s, not a single page of those records have been uh, released to the public, still under the control of the Congressional Intelligence Committees and the National Archives. So then I thought about the State Department's uh, Foreign Relations of the United States series. Fruits, as it's known, is the official documentary record of US foreign policy going back to the Lincoln administration. If an important foreign policy event occurs during an administration, it's in there somewhere. The volumes usually appear about 30 or 40 years after the events they document once the records in question become declassified, which can take a very long time. The volume dealing with the Kennedy administration, the first volume, in Vietnam through August 1963 was published in 1991. It had three editors, only one of whom is still living, Edward Kiefer. The volume skips right over any substance of Lodge's meetings with Kennedy in June and August 1963, but it left me a breadcrumb of hope, what you see here. Editorial note 254 on page 891 of the roughly 1,000 page volume. I've reproduced editorial note 254 here and put a red box around the line that caught my eye. No record of their discussion has been found. It refers to the Kennedy Lodge meeting on August 15th, 1963, the last time they would speak before Lodge left for Saigon right after his appointment, and the most obvious time Kennedy would have provided his personal instructions. I came to learn Ted Kiefer's style over the course of many first volumes. Uh, he must have edited dozens that he edited. 
He was a general editor of the series for, for years. And while the JFK volume in 1991 was one of his first, uh, you know, I tracked him down, semi-retired, working as a consultant at the Office of Secretary of Defense and to see if he, it, this might ring any bells. I did not expect him to uh, remember a single footnote in a single you know, volume from 30 years ago, but he did. I told him that I noted the phrase, no record of their discussion has been found was not his usual style, and he agreed. It didn't say there wasn't a record, only that it could not be found. Uh, then he told me about the unusual process that Fruce editors uh, use to access uh, Kennedy tapes. Despite their statutory responsibility to produce a complete record of foreign policy, the Fruce team was restricted only to Cuban Missile Crisis tapes that were specifically approved by Kennedy National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. Uh, former JFK Library archivist Sheldon Stern, arguably the greatest living expert on the provenance of the Kennedy tapes, told me the Bundy review process was a joke because he was old and could barely hear the tapes. Kennedy uh, Kiefer told me uh, he reviewed his notes related to editorial note 254 and saw a post-it note to check tape 104. I was already making regular research trip to Boston and the JFK library was one of my regular stops. So I got a plane ticket and went up there. This was when the Kennedy library was just starting to digitize records and, and, and put them online. You know, some things were online already and some things weren't. It's still that way today. Although uh, the Kennedy library, I think arguably is the leader among the presidential libraries in terms of digitization of the whole system. Uh, Lodge's meetings with Kennedy's were important enough that the president had photos taken of the, of the meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. This first photo, is from the June 1963 meeting between Kennedy and Lodge when the consensus is that Kennedy first asked Lodge to go to Vietnam as US ambassador and Lodge accepted. Despite what has been written about the Kennedy and Lodge families being enemies, I would call them friendly rivals. They were cut from similar cloths. They played touch football on the weekends. Uh, one was old money, one was new. You know, one was a wasp and the other was Catholic. But I would argue they had more in common than most people realize. And they'd known each other for a long time. Uh, Joe Kennedy had even financially supported some of Lodge's earlier political races, which helped to clear the deck for a fresh face in the Democratic Party. Uh, this is when they faced off for the Senate in 1952, when commentators at the time said it was the race to watch in the nation. The winner was seen as someone who, have a, who would have a shot at the presidency. To me, Kennedy looked so young in this photo, but he was actually the, the same age as Lodge when Lodge first won a Senate seat in 1936. Kennedy uh, in 1936, then an undergraduate at Harvard, never imagined he would one day face off against Lodge for the Senate in 1952, let alone defeat him. Uh, between Lodge and his grandfather, they held a Senate seat for, 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 all, for all but 14 years between 1893 and 1953, a period of 60 years. Uh, photos were also taken of Lodge's August 15th meeting with Kennedy, the photo that you, you see here and the primary subject of, my, of this search for their discussion. When I first saw this photo, the historian in me was just dying to know what could be printed on the piece of paper on the table or in the envelope, neither of which have ever surfaced in the archives. The, these photos captured an unusual color for the time, let me feel so close to the conversation, like a fly on the wall, yet just out of earshot. The fact is, I knew from the Nixon tapes that ambassadorial farewells are rarely substantive. It's often 15 minutes, a handshake, a photograph. You know, no president can even know enough about all parts of the world to say something substantive to an ambassador preparing to leave for that country. So I did what few people ever do, start to listen to hours and hours of Kennedy tapes. I had no reason to believe a tape of Lodge existed. Uh, there, remember, there's no log published in the Washington Post. No scholarly book had ever mentioned a tape. No scholar believed one existed, and neither the church committee nor the Pentagon Papers mentioned its possibility either. All I had to go on was the clue that Ted Kiefer gave me. I started toward the beginning of 1963, where there's a shift in, the, in war strategy begin, in, beginning in January. That way I could get months of context uh, leading up to uh, the meeting, two lo meetings that Lodge had with Kennedy in June and August. I listened to probably 100 hours of Kennedy tapes and took notes while listening. Uh, assigned grad students to follow up on certain clues. Uh, a lot of those grad students are thanked in the back of the book. I heard a lot of really interesting things that probably could be a book on their own. And as I inched toward the summer of 1963 on the recordings, uh, what I hoped to find and thought I would find were conversations about Lodge, 
the, for example, a deliberative process to appoint him. The summer months when Vietnam increasingly took more and more of Kennedy's personal time, especially after May and, and August. And Lodge's departure in mid-August uh, represented in this photo. Finally, I got the tape 104, which is the one that Ted Kiefer said to look into. Buried on a tape, uh, in the middle of that tape that included conversations recorded at other times and other subjects, immediately I recognized Lodge's voice. I knew what it sounded like from other parts of this research. His accent was not a typical Boston accent, like Kennedy or relevant for me with the Nixon tapes, Chuck Colson. I knew Lodge's accent was different, more like FDR. It's kind of like a patrician accent. And I was stunned when I heard it. Uh, I, I asked the JFK Library archivist whether anyone had ever transcribed the tape or whether a transcript had ever been published anywhere. They could not claim with certainty, but they did not think so. Uh, later, I found two popular books that mentioned the existence of a tape, uh, but those authors became aware of it when it was still largely classified, whereas what I heard was everything except for 38 seconds that were still restricted. And I was able to use it in other records uh, that I'd gotten through FOIA and review process at the library to then go back to Lodge's family, others who'd worked with them uh, during interviews and to corroborate the, the tape content with these fresh archival records that I was able to obtain through about 200 FOIA requests. I spent several months listening to the conversation easily more than 100 times. Because the thing about audio, it's, it's, it's much more of an art than a science. I mean, you can listen to something 100 times and feel like you've really got it down. And then you go, you, know, you go play with your kid or you go do some gardening outside and they do, do something that has the effect of clearing your short-term memory. And then when you return to the audio on the 101st time, you hear just a word or two different. Sometimes that can, that can change the meaning of a passage. Uh, so it, as my transcript got better of this, of this meeting, uh, I shared it with no one. Uh, whereas many researchers would have been excited, I was terrified. Uh, I did the opposite of what I should have done. I think a better self-promoter would have fired off an, an 850 word op-ed of the first place that would publish it. You know, I should have claimed it as my own and planted my flag. Instead, I took about four years to study this recording and share it with a, a very small number, a few, and then a, then a number that grew over time, hoping that no one would scoot me in the meantime. I knew from working on the Nixon tapes for many years that tapes can give a listener a false sense of security. You know, perhaps we believe something more because we heard it ourselves. They must be interpreted, corroborated, triangulated, and put in their proper context. Even with tapes, the writing of history remains a collaborative process. And as my understanding of its content matured, although there are still mysteries about it I can't answer, and I shared it with a very small group, I felt, I felt as though almost it was like protecting a trade secret. And if you want to protect the exact recipe of Coca-Cola, you either tell everyone or you tell no one. And I decided in this case, I shouldn't share it with any journalists, friends, fellow, certainly fellow historians could not be trusted. So I, sh I shared it and gained additional insights about its content with a few early on who were close to the participants in this meeting depicted in the photo here. Lodge's son, George Cabot Lodge, uh, Henry Kissinger, and uh, three and four, the last two living Kennedy officials who were senior enough then to know the subject well, Rufus Phillips introduced earlier, but also Thomas, Thomas Hughes, the Kennedy State Department Director for Intelligence and Research. You can read more about it in the book, including excerpts from the tape uh, in question, uh, because and some of you by now might have read about it in the review or heard some of it yourself, because not only do I tell the story better there, but I also discuss a number of other secrets I found in the archives. However, I'd like to give you my sort of bottom line interpretation, uh, especially for those of you who've heard part of the recording of this August 15th, 1963 recording of Lodge's farewell uh, meeting with Kennedy in the Oval Office. Uh, my take on the tape and, and really, you know, it's mysterious provenance, uh, which goes beyond just the daunting task of writing a biography of Lodge, was that it was JFK's green light to contact the generals and look into the possibility of a coup. Uh, JFK was willing to accept a coup under certain conditions. It's the first, this tape is the, I argue, is the first evidence to surface that demonstrates JFK's knowledge and involvement in discussion of a possible coup at an early date and by that, I mean prior even to Lodge's departure for Saigon. I did not argue that it was an order for a coup. And I say clearly in the book that it was Eisenhower and not Kennedy who made regime change a part of US foreign policy in the 1950s. And I'm also not sure another, another president in JFK's situation in 1963 would have come to a dramatically different policy outcome. 
I mean, it was uni universal at the time that, that uh, ZM had to go and he was unpopular. Uh, secondly, uh, in my interpretation, rather than killing ZM as Lodge has been accused of, and is a, a, a key part of the conventional wisdom of the US involvement in the ZM coup, I document in the book based on newly available evidence, which means I also have to keep my mind open uh, to the possibility that additional evidence will become available one day that could change my mind, uh, that Lodge tried to save ZM by offering to give him asylum in the US embassy and provide for his safe passage out of the country. I reveal not one, but, but a second mysterious phone call that Lodge had with ZM on November 2nd, the morning after the coup, shortly before he was apprehended and murdered. In other words, Lodge and other American officials, including the CIA, were not involved in ZM's murder, although they had good reason to believe the Vietnamese generals running the coup planned to dispose of ZM somehow. And to me, I believe these findings change the history uh, of how the US got involved in the Vietnam War before the first combat troops were ever deployed. Kennedy's assassination combined with Lodge's reticence to publish a fuller account, not to mention ZM's own assassination and a country, South Vietnam, that ceased to exist in 1975, held back our understanding of this critical moment in Cold War history when we broke and bought Vietnam. It's an important piece of the puzzle, although not the final one, uh, a revision of the current conventional wisdom uh, that there's not a scintilla of evidence that Kennedy had knowledge in the pre-coup period of a coup, let alone an assassination, which Lodge, war Lodge warns Kennedy about more than once uh, as being a strong possibility during their, this taped conversation on August, 19, uh, August 15th, 1963. Kennedy never spoke about his meeting with Lodge. Lodge was never asked by anyone about the meeting with suspicion to believe anything substantive was discussed. And the mysterious tape showed up at the JFK library decades later after it was supposed to not exist. When it was first partially declassified in 2009, the tape merited only the briefest mention in an Associated Press write-up that devoted more space to discussing President Obama's foreign policy in Afghanistan at the time than what the tape actually said. It remained hidden in plain sight until I finally took the advice that I've given to my own students on countless occasions Go back and check the audio for yourself. Well, after the coup, uh, I'll share my screen a, a final time here. After the coup, uh, Lodge made plans to return to the US for consultations with Kennedy. Now that would have been a conversation I wish we'd taped. Uh, instead, while en route, Lodge learned that Kennedy himself uh, was killed just three weeks after the ZM coup. When Lodge arrived in Washington, he was the first American diplomat that President Johnson met with. Here in this photo, along with Rusk, McNamara, and George Ball from left to right. It was so soon after Kennedy's death that Johnson was still using the vice president's office in the, in the EOB. He hadn't yet moved into the White House. And instead of huddling with Kennedy, Lodge paid his, his final respects to him at Arlington National Cemetery. And Johnson convinced Lodge to stay in Vietnam and then ultimately to go back. I, uh, uh, another time in 1965 and 1967. So where does this leave us? In conclusion, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. was an enigma who did little to redress such misunderstandings and many other mysteries in the book during his lifetime. Instead, Lodge left his secrets in his papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society with many memoranda to himself, a journal or diary entries and handwritten notes scattered throughout different places of his 50 year career. Uh, much of which occurred around key people and key events. I was fortunate enough simply to have been the first researcher to use, utilize his papers for their full value, itself a, a long process. The result is a book that I cannot say entirely removes the mystery behind the man. I did my best with the, the canvas I had available. You know, I had a, I had a book contract for 150,000 words, submitted a manuscript for around 283,000 words, and what you see in the finished book is a compromise that ended up around 200,000 words. That said, certainly new evidence will one day come to light that will cause his, uh, us to consider his era, his values further, might even date some of the findings in this book, but that's a risk that I'm willing to take. Uh, what I've written will be hardly be the final word, and I'm hardly the kind of person to say this is all we know. In that sense, our understanding of, his, of the life and times of Henry Cavill Lodge Jr., with the appearance of this first full biography that tries to restore him to the place in history that he always really occupied is itself a lesson about the essence of history.
it's never really over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke, if I could um, use your first name. Um, let me just quibble with you about the title. And Gene Becker, President Bush's uh, 41's chief of staff will hit me in the head for asking this, but I've contended all along that George H.W. Bush was the last Brahmin. And in fact, when I read your introduction, I thought I was reading a bio of George H.W. Bush. Lots of foreign experience, military service in the Second World War, a sense of public uh, spirit, a, a sense of duty, uh, a non-ideological, uh, practical, pragmatic approach, a, what I would call a conservative internationalist. I mean, uh, there are some historians that you know, have this dark view of the United States as building an empire. Um, and I don't want to get into these kinds of debates because I, don't, I frankly don't think they're particularly useful. But the, the, um, the, there is liberal internationalism, but conservative internationalists do take a different view, but they are internationalists nevertheless. And both Bush and Lodge came from the same tradition. George Bush was brought up. He went to Yale and then he went to Phillips Exeter Academy an elite school in Massachusetts. He went to Yale. His father was a United States Senator. I mean, the parallels and the, the, the manner of making friends across the aisle, making friends abroad, the, the, the way in which they conducted themselves, the patrician manner, um, was, was so similar. I mean, uh, Gene Becker says that President Bush tried to live all this down when he moved to Texas, and he did to some degree, but you know, his roots were still in New England. He was actually not born in Connecticut, he was born in Massachusetts, in Milton, Massachusetts. So, so anyway, could you comment on that? I mean, that's quibbling with, with uh, uh, your, 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 your very, uh, very appropriate title, but wh why did you, what's the word Brahmin mean? Why do, why do people in Massachusetts use that term to describe this old patrician class of, of families? Well, first I say, I thank you for the question. Um, I have been preparing for years for that question. <laughs> and I, think <laughs> first, I, I don't know whether I'll convince anybody, but um, you know, the, the way I look at it is everything you said is exactly right. I, 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 you know, and, and you read this first chapter in the book, which really focuses on the Brahmins and the family history that goes back to the Mayflower, especially on the, on the Cabot side. Um, and uh, no quibbles at all. The difference, and here's the but, I don't, you know, even Lodge, you could argue, was not a total Brahmin. I mean, it, it, I think if it smelled the inside of a tank during combat, yeah, that's not a place a Brahmin hangs out. And Lodge, you know, was in the army beginning in the 1920s before it was mechanized. Um, you know, so even Brahmin, even he has kind of this hybrid. The, the, this is why I, I say make the title the way I do. And this is the but to your answer. I do not see Lodge going to the oil fields of West Texas for a part of his career. You know, I Lodge really never left New England. I mean, except for on the train down to Washington. I mean, the only time he spent in a place like West Texas was maneuvers outside of El Paso with the army. I mean, <laughs> that was, and, and I think that was good for him because it broadened his social circle. It exposed him to a lot of different kinds of people and probably was good in a way for President Bush. I mean, certainly that was a, a big change to his paradigm and worldview. But I think that's the difference is that I think Lodge was a bit of a hybrid. Bush was more of a hybrid. You know, the Lodge family, they quibbled and said, no, actually the son, George, who's in his 90s, he's the last Brahmin because he was really the first uh, generation of Brahmins. Being a Brahmin was an asset, but somewhere right after the World War II, it went from being an asset to being a liability. And you really see the children of, of Lodge's generation, like George, who's a retired Harvard Business School professor in his 90s now, who really shunned that, who didn't want to go to private school anymore, didn't want to be driven around. And there was something about the next generation where there was a firm break because, I mean, the Lodges almost continuously or through one of their family lines, the Freeling Heisens, the Cabots, the Lodges, the Lowells, I mean, all the family the branches of the tree, you can take a number of branches back to the Mayflower, back to before the, found, the, the creation of the Republic, but, but no lodge has held office. It was a clean break in the 1950s. And I think that's where it goes from being a Brahmin become from an asset to a liability. That was the clean break. So I agree on all your points, except for I could never see a lodge working in West Texas. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, let me just bring up one point. Of the last six governors in Massachusetts, five were moderate Republicans and three, I, I, I knew them because I was involved in state politics. Uh, myself, I served as Secretary of Administration of Finance under Paul Salucci, Italian American. But uh, Bill Weld was a Brahmin Yankee. I mean, he wasn't from uh, that old family, but his, his family goes back uh, a century or two. He was governor. Charlie Baker actually comes from the mess, but what he's a wasp. And Mitt Romney, um, uh, arguably his family is, for, you know, is from Michigan or from Utah, but he was governor of Massachusetts. He certainly is a patrician in terms of his manner too. So they, they don't have quite the pedigree of Lodge, but I would not say that it is a liability at all in Massachusetts. And I, I'll tell you why. My father, my family comes from a, a mill workers, poor immigrant Greek mill workers in Lowell, Massachusetts. My father said that all of the politicians in the state are corrupt except for the, the Brahmin Yankees. They're the only ones we can trust who don't have their hand in the till. And my father always voted for them, even though he's from a poor mill workers family. And, and he told me what he would had met Lodge several times when he was campaigning. And he said, when Lodge spoke to you, you thought that no one, that, that he gave the impression that you were the only person in the world he was listening to. And the other person who had that quality was Bill Clinton, apparently, huh. that he gave the impression of this direct connection that my father said was so stunning. And other people he said in Lowell would mention the same thing when he would campaign. So there is a, an attraction still in Massachusetts. You know, Teddy White in 1960 said in his Making of the President, uh, uh, in, in the first book he wrote of the series in 1960, he said the most venal, corrupt, and decadent political system in the country outside the courthouse states of the South was Massachusetts, Maryland, and I think it was Indiana. I can't, and Chicago, and, and uh, Illinois. But he included Massachusetts. He included <laughs> Massachusetts in that list. So there was an attraction, I think, of Lodge because he was not seen as part of that system. But I, I shouldn't be speaking, it's your biography. But let me let me ask you something else. Um, you you uh, characterize uh, Lodge. How would you characterize the connection between Henry Cabot Lodge and uh, Nelson Rockefeller, for example, another patrician, but from a different state? With a, with a shorter pedigree, because his grandfather was, after all, only wealthy in the late 19th century, didn't go back as far as the lodges do. No, I think that's very interesting. Um, and certainly during, uh, well, I mean, I should say they're, they're allies. Um, I think even Lodge and, and Rockefeller were, were allies more so than, than most other Republicans were allies with, with Rockefeller. You know, you take like a, a Gerald Ford or you take a Richard Nixon, and Nixon especially. I mean, it was, I think the, 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 the unofficial term might be frenemies uh, between the two at times. Whereas I think Lodge was closer. I mean, I mean, in 64, you can definitely see in the book that uh, when, when Lodge's campaign ultimately doesn't take off, uh, you know, I think his son uh, swings support behind Rockefeller. He encourages his delegates to support Rockefeller. They're uh, sharing campaign resources. So no, I think they're similar. I think what, what you know, what I found in, and of course, researching the, the history of the Brahmins and these families was, was new for me. Um, and uh, at, the, at the Mass Historical Society is not just Lodge's papers, but his grandfather's papers are also there. And uh, another uh, Salt and Stahl papers, I mean, a number of sort of Brahmin type oh, collections. Richardson? Exactly. Oh, yeah, the, there's a, there, they have extensive collections there. And, um, you know, I, I think what I would say is, is uh, there was a phrase that stuck out to me early on in the research that, um, you know, I think, I, you know, that you, you have these different Brahmins I and mean, you have kind of New York Brahmins, you have Boston Brahmins, you could argue later you had Chicago Brahmins. And I think, you know, they really were kind of different social circles. Uh, I mean, I mean, they were different. I mean, the one phrase that stuck out is, you know, it, for Boston Brahmins, uh, people cared who your grandparents were. I mean, it was sort of a sense of history. And, you know, you, especially if you had a, a, an ancestor on the Mayflower, whereas, you know, New York is sort of much more like who you were or what, what you have accomplished on your own um, and tied, of course, much more to the financial markets. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think, you know, there are these different kind of Brahmin sets. And in the first chapter, I try to, you know, distinguish between the different types uh, of the Boston Brahmins and their history. You know, I originally, I, I found it so interesting to, and I, I wanted to make this part of the book bigger. And I was so far over length that it's, at some point, my editor had to say, wait, 
you know, your job is to write a biography of someone born in 1902 who has a 50 year political career of his own. You know, so a lot of that ended up getting cut. Um, so a lot of these other names, they make cameos at times, even Bill Clinton makes a cameo in the book in the conclusion. Um, but uh, I, I would, I think the best thing is, you know, Lodge was clearly from the side of the party, even the side of the moderate to liberal wing of the party as Rockefeller. And they were, uh, I think, at, at times, I think, pretty close allies, especially in 64. I would say, though, from your own work, that Lodge on foreign policy was much more of a hardliner than Nelson Rockefeller was. The stuff he did at the UN with checking security clearances for people and trying to root out people who might be uh, Soviet spies within the UN system. I was, I was taken aback by that, actually. Well, and I think Lodge felt that he, he, had, to, he had to do something, because if you look at yes. the domestic pressure, the McCarthy era, and what the FBI, what Hoover was doing and demanding, I mean, I think, I, and my own take on that is that Lodge did the minimum that he felt that he had to, you know, yeah. up in New York, you know, to, to not, make it a, not make it a domestic issue for Eisenhower. Yeah. The other thing that I was fascinated by is the closeness of the McCarthy family with the Kennedy family. I knew that Bobby Kennedy worked for Joe McCarthy on that Senate committee. I did not know the families attend each other's weddings. They socialized together and they were close friends and uh, that, that um, they were involved in the campaigns. Uh, it was, I was taken aback by that. You, you don't, you do not, you take a realistic view of the Kennedy family in Massachusetts that it wasn't in fact Camelot, that it was old Massachusetts politics in some of it on a darker side of things. And that old man Kennedy, Joe Kennedy, in some ways bought the election. I mean, you, you, you quoted the statistics on these spending levels were extraordinary. You also had a sentence I was unclear about because it was the implications of it were quite profound if it's true. And I don't know if you just heard it as a report, you said, that money may have been laundered through the Catholic Church, that there was a million dollars uh, that Kennedy gave the archdiocese when the collections were 950,000. Could you explain that a little bit that to go into that is, <laughs> did you have that documented? Well, so there's, um, you know, there's been these kinds of allegations and, you know, I try to stay out of that, you know, to me, you know, it, I, I deal with a lot of myth and, and, and innuendo and rumors. And to me, if you can't document something, Generally, you know, it's, there's got to be something there, even for it to be a footnote. So in this case, I, and if you can't document anything, then you kind of just leave it out, was my approach. But in this case, I was uh, at the archives of the, the diocese in Boston, um, and uh, I was, uh, you know, we were looking at all, all these records from various, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, uh, Kennedy correspondence, Lodge correspondence, family correspondence, I mean, the Kennedy's um, and, and they started, they, after a few, after a while, uh, uh, sitting in there and just going through boxes, they started telling me these stories. And, um, you know, some of the stories were, were, uh, were, I thought were pretty outrageous. And I was surprised they were telling me them. Uh, they, they told me uh, two that, that I can recall right now. One was the example you gave there, that uh, even internally at the diocese, there people spoke of, it was known commonly that um, one of the techniques that Joe Kennedy would do was typically it would be, you know, maybe Monday after an Easter mass or series of Easter masses, and he would need, you know, clean cash for a campaign. And what the diocese told me, and don't, don't, don't quote me, is that, you know, he would write a million dollar check to the diocese. He would get back 950,000 in clean cash, which because the, you know, the Monday after the Monday after the Easter masses, the church has a lot of cash sitting around from, 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 uh, all the tithing, uh, and uh, it would take the fifty thousand as a tax deduction, and then also told me uh, stories that you know they, they would tip. Kennedy's often would would sponsor orphanages and children's hospitals in politically strategic parts of the state, and you know give a, a you know maybe the first ten percent of a pledge and never quite get around to giving the rest. But while they've already captured all the publicity, you know of the ribbon cutting and, and all of that to the region. So no, I mean, I mean, I, I really, this isn't, I, I'm, I don't feel that I'm critical of the Kennedys. I'm, I'm really in awe and impressed because what the Kennedys do in the book that, that I hope comes across is, is, you know, Lodge was a legendary campaigner. I, I mean, the systems that he had, the Kennedys just learned how to do it better. And, no, no and they did, I, they did. But not only that, but I think to conclude the thought, you know, Lodge ran, you know, three times for a tough Senate race, 36, 42 and 46 each against legendary Democrats. 
uh, who, who are, I mean, odds were against him almost every time. He not only beat them, but he beat them in part with Joe Kennedy money, lodged it. And by doing so, you know, there were no serious uh, Democratic heavyweights left in Massachusetts by, you know, by the late 40s. And so the, in the meantime, the Kennedys had, had studied, I see in the Kennedy records, they actively studied the Lodge campaign techniques, helped Lodge defeat, you know, all the big names in the state party. And, and, and as I said before, really completely cleared the deck for a fresh face. And Lodge always said, my grandfather always got the Irish vote because he, he always marched in the parades. He went to every funeral. He always knew how to dress. Uh, Lodge, the one I see, the focus of this book, always got the Irish vote. And Lodge always said, when they could, you know, the, the first or second generation Irish weren't organized enough to compete. But by the third generation, the Kennedys, they were not only organized, but they wanted to elect a Brahmin of their own. So the funding plus the technique and the studying of Lodge, you know, they, they knew what they were doing by 52 when this young 36 year old Kennedy defeated Lodge. It was also that the Massachusetts, people forget this, but Massachusetts was the most Republican state in the country from the Civil War, which was the base of Lincoln's support, Abraham Lincoln's support, up until 1952. The Republican National Committee was dominated by the Massachusetts. It's, that's when the shift took place. It wasn't just in 52, it was in 48, 50, and 52. 52 was the, uh, he was the, his defeat, Lodge's defeat, brought uh, the, the patrician uh, Irish to the office. The interesting thing is in Massachusetts, the mo still today, the one ethnic group most difficult to get to vote for any Republican are the Irish. And when you wrote all this, I was saying that is the, the, the big group that shifts back and forth are the Italian Americans. They mm -hmm. will vote for Republicans easily if they like them, particularly if they're Italian American, like Paul Salucci won the governorship as an Italian American. The Irish are very difficult to switch. And the fact that, that, that Lodge was so good at this, I thought was remarkable. And I did not know that until I read your book. Well, and to go back to your McCarthy point, you know, I mean, I think it's a point well taken. I, I don't think that the, the close association between the Kennedys and the McCarthys is something the Kennedys have really documented or wanted to document. Right. But I, but I think it was a great political alliance because in South Boston, you had the Catholic, you had the strong anti-communist. Um, and you know, this, this, this association really came to a head in, again in 52 when, when Kennedy ran against Lodge for the Senate because it was a close race. I mean, Kennedy was running, a, as I say, was very or well organized and very well funded. And what Lodge determined uh, would be enough to put him over the top would be Joe McCarthy's endorsement. This, this was in 52 before his downfall, which began 53, 54, the army hearings. And uh, Lodge, Lodge was negotiating with McCarthy to come to Massachusetts and campaign on behalf of Lodge. And it was a carefully worded statement. There's a text they, they passed back and forth. But Lodge's advisor said, it, it, it wouldn't be enough for him to speak in favor of us to win. We need him to speak in favor of us and be critical of Kennedy. And that do. was what McCarthy was not willing to do because of this very close association with, between the families. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, the diplomatic career after Vietnam? Uh, I was fascinated by how close Lodge himself was with Cardinal Cushing, who was a legendary archbishop in Boston and a cardinal later. Uh, and I didn't know that. And, and um, how Lodge voted with the Catholics in the, in the Senate which nowadays would not happen. Uh, the Republicans uh, would not vote uh, uh, frequently with, because the Catholic Church is not the, does not have the power it used to have in Massachusetts politics for a variety of reasons. But can you talk a little bit about that connection to the Catholic Church uh, that Lodge had and, and the fact that Nixon asked him to be the envoy to the Vatican? Yeah, so, um... You know, I, I, I think that the closeness between Lodge and the Catholics in long before the Vatican to the Holy See, you know, which is itself kind of interesting, a semi-retired, you know, I mean, Lodge's appointment was really controversial at the time, but he was the one that really helped to pay full-time uh, diplomatic relations with the Vatican beginning in the 1980s. But I think a lot of this comes from his brother, uh, John Davis Lodge, uh, the Connecticut governor, member of Congress, uh, kind of B-list movie star. He married a Catholic, a Catholic Italian woman. 
Um, and I, and so the, the, he became Catholic. They raised their kids Catholic. And so during, six, during 1960 in the campaign, when Lodge was running with Nixon, and on the other side, of course, Kennedy and Johnson, um, you know, the issue of Catholicism came up. And, you know, I think a lot of the media, a lot of American people said, can we elect the first Catholic? You know, would a, would a Catholic take orders from the Pope? I mean, to, as a, to me, as someone who was raised a Catholic, um, it seems kind of silly and antiquated to read now, but I think this was a real concern back then. And Lodge, um, you know, no, you couldn't make an issue of with Lodge. I mean, I think if he were more of a, a you know, I, I don't know if he, if he wanted to make an issue about religion, he could have. But instead, Lodge said, that uh, you know, I don't. I don't plan to ever raise the issue. Um, I would certainly hope that uh, my own uh, nephews, that my own uh, my 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 brother's children, could one day become president if they were so qualified and ran and won. And so I don't plan to make an issue of it. And so I think starting with his brother, and then in 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 Vietnam, um, being coming the Catholic Church was very important. Uh, the Xiem government, Xiem was Catholic. The Vatican, uh, the envoy from the Vatican uh, in, in Saigon was very influential uh, when during Lodge's ambassadorship. And then of course Lodge was uh, chosen, uh, the Vatican was very happy to see Lodge become envoy, not quite ambassador, he had ambassadorial rank, but envoy to the Vatican uh, during the Nixon and Ford years, during most of the 1970s until the first six months of the Carter administration. And so I think he had really a lifelong association with Catholics that I would argue started first early on with his exposure, maybe through the army to different kinds of people, but through his brother's marriage and, and becoming that becoming more normal. But certainly he would have interacted with a lot of Catholics in Massachusetts politics. So I, I think he, he, you know, he was he was fairly ecumenical, you know, about about his beliefs. You you mentioned the fact that he was an Episcopalian twice, once in the introduction and once at the end when he died. Um, did that play any role? Did he go to church? Did, was he a, a real believer or did, was it just an institution at, w along with other Brahmin Yankees? I mean, he, I mean, he, he did, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that, uh, you know, um, you know, he, I, I don't know how regularly he went to church, uh, but he, he also went to mass sometimes, um, you know, in particular, he went to, during his, uh, his ambassadorial tenure in Vietnam, he went to mass regularly. Um, also, because it was good, good visible politics, and it pleased ZM and pleased the governments. Many, many of the, of course, the, the South Vietnamese elite had been uh, either educated in France or had converted, or I mean, some were Buddhist, but many were Catholic. Um, so, so I, I wouldn't say you know he was sort of someone who was consistently guided by his faith, uh, but I think he did maintain a like lifelong association. You know, he did attend, uh, but but also not attend exclusively the Episcopalian Church. Hmm. Are there any final comments? Because we're now over time. We promised you an hour, and we're we're at over an hour now. You know, I do see one question in the comments um, that was typed in here. Um, uh, you know, what that I can answer here. You know, what did Lodge uh, mean during his tenure at the UN that he was quote not bound by instructions while at the UN? You know, what <laughs> what did he what did he mean by that? It's a good question. Um, you know, I, you know, so I think the simplest answer I can give is, um, you know, both in the UN, so he was ambassador to the UN for, for almost all eight years, I mean, more than seven, seven and a half years of the Eisenhower administration. I mean, one of the most important periods of the Cold War to be on really the front line of Cold War diplomacy. And then also, you know, of course, in Vietnam under Kennedy and Johnson, when he took these jobs, you know, Lodge, given the background, uh, of him, of his family that we've been talking about, uh, was not someone uh, who was going to be happy of point, uh, reporting to some assistant secretary. Um, Eisenhower had 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 still continued to Lodge transformed the. I mean, Lodge's role at the UN was transformed by Eisenhower, cabinet rank. He he had I think breakfast with Eisenhower once a week. He attended cabinet meetings. He retained a role as a political advisor to Eisenhower throughout the eight years. And so Lodge really believed he was the personal ambassador for Eisenhower, kind of a permanent set of eyes and ears at the UN. And, and he really, I mean, there's a, a degree of arrogance here, um, but he really, he was appointed to be a personal ambassador in, at the UN and also under Kennedy and Johnson. And so it was, it was I, th I think it's, it was a little challenging to manage an ambassador like Lodge because he wanted to talk directly to the Secretary of State, someone he considered his peer and someone he'd known for a long time, or even to the presidents. I mean, this is someone whose peer group were other were presidents, you know, going back to Teddy Roosevelt. So it, it did take a little extra handling if you if you were managing Lodge. I might add, he's not the last one. Uh, 
Jean <laughs> Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick did not take orders from the State Department. <laughs> she was ambassador under Reagan, and neither did John Bolton. Jim, John Bolton just did whatever the hell he wanted to in the UN. And, and that I might add, uh, when Jack Danforth, the US, former US Senator from Missouri, I knew him well because he had the portfolio for Sudan, which I later had as envoy to Sudan for President Bush. And Jack Danforth just gave his own speeches. <laughs> he ignored the-, the I think uh, it's a pro and right. con when you appoint someone at that level, that that's, yes. just, that's how it's gonna be. But it's a good that's, question, I appreciate that. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for being with us. I think you've done a great service to write this book and clarify these issues that are, I think, of, of importance, and not just to, to, to assess blame, but to set the historical record straight. And, and uh, it's, it's sort of like a, a Sherlock Holmes mystery, you're putting the pieces together to come out with a, a, a reality about what happened. Thank well, you let, me, let me be clear. I mean, I, I really, this book, I really just carry the ball down the field five more yards or 10 more yards. I mean, I leave a lot on the table here for future researchers. And anybody has a question or has something that's unclear, you know, ha happy to contact me. We'll talk further. Can I, I just have one last question. In the earlier biography of Henry Cabot Lodge, which was written what, 30, 40 years ago, there's a scene where Lodge is a reporter at the 1928 Democratic Convention where Al, uh, Al Smith was being nominated and he wanted to go and interview Al Smith and Al Smith had these, these, these guys in black coats and black hats con, you know, who was protecting him. And Lodge uh, said, I wanna go and see him. And uh, the bodyguard said no. And he punched the guy and knocked him out straight. And then he walked over his body and went and interviewed Al, Land Al uh, Smith. D you didn't record that in your book. I didn't, couldn't find it. But do you remember this, reading this in the archives? You know, it rings a bell. It it, it doesn't come up. It, it, it that story does not come up in the in the in in the lodge papers. But uh, you know, there's a there's a, a lot of stories like that. I mean, lodge lodge interviewed Benito Mussolini. Uh, I mean, he interviewed all these interesting people. And there's you know, there's not always a transcript or you know any certainly not a recording. Um, but no, I mean, not not every story made it in, and some things had to be cut for length. Uh, but I think you, the example you give is, I'd say that's lodge. I mean, it's just this. Yeah remarkable career. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, bye -bye.